Go ahead. All right. Uh, my name is Frida Alweis. I was born in May 21st in 1933 in a small town called Chortkov, C-H-O-R-T-K-O-W, in Poland, which is the Ukraine now. Okay. A little bit about your family. It's on. <laughs> oh, well, we're not practicing. <laughs> Turn it off. That was good. Me. You did good. Okay, but what do you want me? Okay, it's on. Ready to go. All right. It's going. Um, in 1939, when uh, just before the war started, uh, I was six years old. I had my mom and dad. Uh, we, uh, I was an only child at the time. My mother and uh, my dad both had extended families. We all lived pretty much in the same area. And uh, uh, we had a very good life. My dad uh, was a very busy man. He uh, was uh, making furniture for the whole area. And he had about 12 people working for him and all of that those things were handmade at the time and he was a very uh, fine craftsman which really helped him during the war. I remember as a child of six in 1939 when the war started the Russians invaded our town and it was because Hitler and Stalin made a pact and part of Poland the, east, the eastern part of Poland went to Russia. And at that time, everything just changed. Uh, the things weren't in any, uh, just changed completely. There was not a normal life anymore. Uh, the Russians had a lot of strict rules. But in general, we were not as bad off as the people that lived under Hitler at the time. Uh, I remember at that time, till, uh, till 1941, I started school when I was seven. And I remember that I went to a Yiddish school, which the Russians allowed. And that's the first time that I learned Yiddish, because till then, only Polish was spoken in my house. But for some reason, my parents decided that I should go to a Yiddish school. And mainly they were secular Jews, but they were very uh, Zionist-oriented, and they felt that I needed to know those things. But then in June of 22nd, I can remember it just like it happened today, because it was on a Sunday, and my father and I, we were both in bed listening to music. We happened to have had a radio, and we listened... Uh, the music that came in from Berlin and instead of you know like Moscow or something like that and my mother came running and she said to my dad you know she said the Germans in invaded Russia and when my dad turned on the radio Moscow was saying that in the morning of June 22nd the Russians invaded Russia and we are at war and uh, I think right there and then, my childhood stopped. Because we knew it was all the time that we were under the Russians, we heard what was happening in Poland. And we knew that it was not safe for a Jew to remain under, you know, and uh, become part of Germany. Uh, but two or three days later, my dad was uh, uh, conscripted into the Russian army. And when he left home, he told my mother that there is a possibility, because he was, he was in the army, that we would be able to leave. And he felt that our best chance was to go with the Russians. So about uh, a week later, uh, we found out that there was a train at the railroad st station being readied for uh, uh, people that had that their husbands or women and children 
that their, their fathers and husbands were in the Russian army and that they could be evacuated. And I remember it was probably about the beginning of July and it was a very warm day and my mother dressed me like in three or four dresses, a winter coat and a winter hat and I was just standing there in my, and crying because I wanted to take my cat too and she said, no, the cat cannot go with you. And uh, then we walked to the railroad station and when we got there, my mother's two sisters and a brother were there too. So things looked a little better because we weren't all by ourselves. And uh, the train, we just stood for all the way till the end of the day. And I remember my grandfather, my mother's dad, come to the railroad station and telling my mother, you know, you shouldn't go. You're just a, 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 you know, a woman alone without a husband. You're not going to survive with a small child. And if you don't want to go, uh, you know, back home, he said, well, why don't you just uh, let Frida come home with me? She's a little girl. She's not going to survive such a terrible ordeal. And my mother said, no. She said, where I go, my child goes. And probably because of her stubbornness, and her, her being so resolute to do what's right that I survived that war because children at that age did not survive, very few of them survived the war if they stayed under the, the German occupation. Tell me again, the uh, uh, population of that, that little town was... The population of our town was 30,000. 10,000 of that were Jews, and after the war only 100 survived. And that is, that is including the ones who escaped to Russia. So they, you know, under the, it really, uh, that life, there's no Jews left in that town. That stopped. And Jews lived in that town since the 18th century. Wow. That was part of Poland. That was part of Poland. So we, that evening, the train, started, you know, left. And uh, I think about two days into, into traveling, the tr we stopped in a, in a town. I, I can't remember the name of it, but I re remember my mother started losing her uh, will about going. And she started saying, you know, I think I'm going to get off the next station and go back home. I don't think it's the right thing for me to do. And there was a man there that my mother knew for many years, and he was a friend of hers. He was on the train with us, and he said to my mother, Don't do it. You made a resolution, you and your husband, that you were going to leave and, and not stay under the German occupation. Don't change your mind. And my mother listened to him. And that is another thing that probably saved our lives. Well, that night we kept going. I mean, you know, it, it was a few days into our traveling. We were going toward Kiev. And everybody thought that maybe we would go as far as Kiev, which was at that time, the, uh, even now it's the capital of, Ukraine, of the Ukraine. And we thought that's as far as we would need to go, and that maybe we would stay there a few months and the war is going to finish. Well, we never made it to Kiev because the Hitler's armies were there before us. So we had to change our plan, I mean the train had to change their plans and we started turning east and going toward, toward Russia. And uh, every night we would hear the German planes over us. And sometimes the train would have to stop completely because there shouldn't be any movement and you would see uh, the bombs falling all around and there were many nights that we thought that we were, we were never going to come out alive. Well, eventually we made it to the one of the largest rivers of the Ukraine called the Don. And it was Don, D-O-N. And it was right near Dnepropetrovsk, which was a large city and they had a big uh, dam where they dammed up the water to make electricity 
and we had to cross the river. And the problem was that the Nazis needed to uh, completely uh, to to bomb so that electricity would stop uh, being uh, uh, generated. And every night they would be bombing that place, and we just had stood a few nights before. And during the day, they wouldn't let us cross because there were army trains going through it. Well, finally, after a few days, we crossed to the other side of the, the uh, Down River. And actually, it was, it, it, it was called the Dnieper. It was part of the Don River, but it was called the Dnieper, the, you know, the subsidiary of it. Yes. And uh, ours was the last civilian train that crossed that bridge, because the next day the bombs hit the target, and that was it. No trains could go after that. So that was another, I mean, it just seemed like luck was with us. And we went maybe, we were on the train for about four weeks. And we finally stopped. Uh, it was still, it was already into the, into Russia. And they said, well, maybe we could stop here and we'll see what's going to happen. And they gave us, uh, and the Russian government um, had places where they put us up and they would have soup kitchens, but we were hungry all the time. There was very little food, and uh, even if you wanted to buy it, there was no food. And we were there maybe about two or three weeks, and uh, then they told us that it was, it was not safe, and that we had to go to the railroad station and wait till some trains are going to come, and if we see room on the train, then we should get on it and keep going. And we, they planned for us to go uh, to Stalingrad. They sent us into that direction. Mm. And uh, I remember one day we were waiting for the train and we were hungry and they said there was a soup kitchen not far away. So my mother took me by my hand and she, we walked over and we sat down and they gave us soup. And we started eating, and all of a sudden, uh, the air raid siren went on, and the planes came over. And I remember my mother grabbing me by the hand, and I cried, I want my soup, and she just grabbed me, and I felt I was flying in the air, and my soup went down, and we just ran toward the station and to try to find a place, a safe place where the thing is so that they were not looking for that railroad station. They were looking for something else. And the planes passed by, and that night, finally, a train came by. And we got on the train, and I think it took, I, I can't remember how many days, but we finally made it to Stalingrad. And that must have been probably someplace in, uh, sometimes in August. And when we got to Stalingrad, they said, well, we think maybe we're fairly safe here. And they put us up in a collective farm where they were growing. Uh, their main crop were watermelons. Mm. And the interesting part is that they had a German population there. They were called the Volga Germans. They were there since... Uh, uh, Peter the Great brought them in to build Russia, and they, they lived there. And it was a very, very um, productive uh, collective farm. And that's one place that we had plenty to eat. And we stayed there till about October. And then things started going bad. The uh, Nazis, the Nazi army was very getting very close to Stalingrad. And they said that they were going to, we have to get on a boat on the Volga River and go further east. Were you working when you were in Stalingrad? 
Uh, my you mother remember? was. I was just, uh, you know, I remember going to school. They sent me to school, and my mother used to go and pick uh, watermelons. And I remember we had to eat watermelons. Until today, I can't look at watermelons. <laughs> I mean, everybody loves watermelons, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I just, too many. too many watermelons. Not, you know, it was not good. Uh, even though we had enough to eat, we still, you know, the conditions were not that great. And, you know, I was just a child. I was eight years old, and I, you know, I was taken out of a normal life, and, and I was traveling. I didn't know where I was going. When you were on the trains, what was the condition on the train? <laughs> Were we were in a cattle. No, we were in a cattle car. Wow! No, the, no facilities. No facilities. The train was stopped. Were they crowded? It, it, was, it was pretty crowded. It was not uh, terrible. I mean, we we had we could lay down, you know, stretch out, and uh, you know, food was very scarce, and uh, sometimes it was very scary because you you always had the planes going over you you. You, you never knew when, you know, how fast the German army was going uh, toward where we were. We really had no idea, what, you know, what was happening. Yeah. And, uh, no you know, you had no toilet facilities. You didn't have, I mean, you, you didn't have where to wash your clothes. I, I don't know how my mother managed, you know. But I remember being a child. And it was in the summertime, and I remember one day the train stopped, and the f it was a, a, a field. It's my telephone. That's okay. It's better my son. There was a, a field full of flowers. You want to get it? I can Oh, that's this. okay. Oh, it's my son, probably. Maybe we should stop it. I don't know if this is going to pick up that sound. It's done. Huh? It's done. Okay. Uh, I remember we stopped in the, in the field and there were beautiful blue flowers. I, you know, you have certain things come to your mind. And it was such a beautiful day. I mean, you, you lived in such terrible conditions on the train and half of the time you didn't have where to eat. And yet the train stopped and you, they opened up the doors and there was those beautiful fields of blue flowers. And I remember, you know, my mother said that I can go run around a little bit, and I ran toward, uh, you know, the um, fields, and I picked flowers, and I made myself a crown to put on my head. I mean, things like this, somehow, you know, you, you can't forget, because they were so unusual. I mean, the, the world was still normal, it's just yeah. we didn't live in, in normal days. But there was contrast. But there was such contrast, yes. Mm -hmm. Contrast of such bad things, and yet there was still beauty in that, in, in, in the world. And this is what really, you know, being an adult now, I can remember it and see it in that perspective. As a child, I just saw those beautiful blue flowers, and I can never forget it. Well, we find, when we uh, finally were told that we had to leave that collective, and we had to get on the boat because before the Volga freezes, so they they brought a big boat and they got us you know, all the refugees. They got us on the boat, and we two uh, two weeks we were on uh, you know on that boat going up the Volga River, and we went as far. It was called Kuybyshev, which at that time was uh, they used it as uh, their instead of because. Uh, Moscow was uh, in big danger at that time, and all the government came to Kuybyshev, and they used it as their, uh, uh, how would you call it, uh, uh, as, you know, where all the government was uh, was uh, in, in Kuybyshev at that time, yeah, and a yeah. lot of refugees. And, and while we were in Kuybyshev, we ran into... Uh, there was a lot of uh, the Polish army there that was uh, sent to Siberia in '39 mm -hmm. by the Russians, the ones that were caught in the Ukraine. And when uh, Russia made a pact, you know, when they were invaded by Germany, they made a pact with the United States and and and. Uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, Britain. So they made a pact that they would send all those, uh, uh, the whole Russian, ar the whole Polish army. Uh, the general at the time, his name was uh, uh, Anderson, Anders, Anders was his name, his Anders army. And they were in Koibyshev at the time, and they were going to travel through, Ru through most of Russia and Asia to Turkey. And since we were Polish citizens, they told us that we would have to get on those trains and we will go with the Polish army as, as far as they can get us to be safe. So the rest of the time, uh, we were on a train with the Polish army. And that took us all the way to Uzbekistan. How do you spell that? <laughs> I am. It's not a town. Uzbekistan is a is a land, an is an yeah. area. Yeah. It's a country now. Uh, so that that took us to Uzbekistan, and uh, we stopped right there because the Polish army kept going toward Turkey, and we, they would not, uh, you know, women and children. They wouldn't take long. It's just the men, and so we were uh, near. There's a city called Tashkent. And uh, then there's another large, beautiful city called Samarkand. You remember how to spell some of these names? Not these really. Not, no, I'd have to get an atlas, okay. you know, to take a look. But uh, it was really very interesting because uh, it was a completely different culture. Yeah. Uh, you know, their, their dress and everything was just so different. And the conditions were just terrible. It was, you know, they had no, they actually had very, didn't have that much room for us. They put us up into, uh, uh, also, you know, uh, where they were growing cotton. They had those, uh, um, you know, the collectives, you know, collective uh, uh, places where they were growing cotton and uh, they put, uh, you know, they put all the, you know, adult people, they put them all to work to pick cotton. Fields and fields of cotton. And they put us up into, they would put so many people into a room. There was no, uh, pl no sanitary conditions whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the night when we came to our destination we absolutely, all day, we had nothing to eat. And when we got there, they gave everybody a sack of grain, and they said, well, there's, right there, there's a stone that you can, you know, uh, grind, it. grind it, and then you, you know, you yeah. put water that, and then you, you make, like, pita breads, and you put <laughs> it on top of, of a burning, well, by the time, it must have been late at night, finally, I remember my mother gave him, gave me like a flat bread that was half-baked. And <laughs> but you ate it. But we ate it. We were happy to have it. It was, it was very hard for my mother because she, there were some people that still were intact. They, you know, they traveled some with their husbands, they, you know, the Polish refugees. But my mother was all by herself. Even so, she had her sisters, but, you know, they had no children. So for them, it, you know, it was different. She had a big responsibility. And it was very hard for her. And, uh, and your father was not My in father was in the Army. We had no idea where he was. Right. And uh, it's just... Uh, that was late. We, we probably got there during the winter months because in 41, toward winter. And uh, so we were, on, on, we, were, we were on the move for almost a half a year, from like from pillar to post. Wow, mostly cattle cars. Mostly cattle cars. The uh, last cattle car we were on, they were... Uh, uh, on one side there was, I don't know how many people, but I was the only child on that side. And then on the other side there were a lot of women with small children. And uh, all the children got sick. 
And when we got to Samarkand, they took him, uh, they, you know, a doctor came, and he said that they all had scarlet fever. And I was the only one that did not get sick. I was the only one that survived, the only child that survived in that cattle car. Wow. Wow. Must have been healthy. Yeah, I was, I, I don't remember, the, I was sick once, and that was uh, a few weeks later, I contracted typhus. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that was very traumatic because they took me away from my mother because I had to be uh, put into quarantine. Yeah. And I remember they took me away and uh, my mother said that for three weeks um, I was completely out of it. Wow. And she could not come close to me. She could only see me through the window. Wow. And after three weeks when I finally woke up, and I could hardly stand, and she said that I would walk and hold on to the uh, walls and then walk to the window to see her. Oh. And, you know, but once I, when, you know, when they were ready to uh, let me out of the hospital, they told my mother that I needed a lot of good food like milk and eggs and all that stuff. And my mother said, where am I going to get it? I have no money. By that time, we were really almost destitute. Sure. And she said that a lot of people helped her. And I really recovered. And after that, I, for all the rest of the war, I never got sick. Oh, you were lucky. I, well, yeah, I was very lucky. But that's not the end of the story yet. I was not done traveling. <laughs> because by sheer luck, my father found us. It so happened that we, when we were in Stalingrad, we met a woman that was from our town, and her husband was in the Russian army too. And she kept, she had his field address, and she kept in touch with him. And she, she you know, she connected, you know, she had nobody, so she stayed with my mother and I and her sisters. And she uh, wrote to her husband that she, you know, that she met us, you know, in Stalingrad and we, we were together. And, of course, my dad, and he, they, you know, was in a different uh, battalion in the army. They, we were from the same town. But my dad was never, never, they never let him go fight. They sent him to Siberia because they didn't trust him, because he was not a Russian uh, a citizen, and they send them to to the camps in Siberia to work. And while we while he was there, one day, a man comes in from our town, and he says to my father, he said, he sees my father. And he says, Schiller, that's my dad. Is, uh, he said, What are you doing here? And he said the same thing you're doing here. He said, But he said, I have news for you. I know where your wife and child are because my wife is together with them. Oh. And can you imagine from all the camps in Siberia that people were sent, he was sent to the same camp where my dad was. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, that's another, you know, lucky thing that happened yeah. to us because my mother and I were actually just about... Uh, we didn't know we were going to survive all that because she was really, she didn't know what to do anymore. She had nothing. But your mother stayed well. She stayed, yeah, we, she stayed not well. Easy. No, yeah, it was not easy, but she stayed well. So one day, she, you know, just after I was sick with the typhus, one day my mother got a letter from my dad. Oh, that must have been wonderful. I mean, that was like, uh, uh, we just couldn't believe ourselves that it really happened. And about two, three months later, he got permission for my mother and me to get on a train and come to Siberia. So again, we went on a train and a cattle car <laughs> with a bunch of army people because they were going to, uh, toward north. They were going toward Arkhangels. And... Uh, and we went into the Ural Mountains. That's where my dad was, in Siberia, the Ural Mountains. And we came there in 1942. 
Mm. And uh, even so, it was one of the coldest places I've ever lived. There was only maybe two, three months of summer there. The rest of the time, you were up to your neck in snow. Wow, did you have warm clothes? But yeah, you, you know, they gave us warm clothes. We, we lived like in one room, but you know, there was, uh, the conditions were not great, but they were much better than till then. And on top of that, we were together with my dad. And because he was such a, he was a very talented man, he made beautiful furniture. And all the people in the, the bigwigs there wanted things done by him. And uh, even so, a lot of times we went hungry, but a lot of times we did get food and things got much better then. And, uh, and it was Siberia. They was in Siberia. I did go to school in Siberia, and uh, the war kept going on. It was, uh, I remember in 1943, uh, they started bringing uh, German prisoners into those camps to work, because they were big ammunition uh, uh, factories there, because they had... Uh, uh, copper mines and, you know, coal mines in there. You, you know, it was a very rich in, in natural resources in Siberia. And this was their, you know, this is where they did all their, uh, uh, they made all their uh, things for the, you know, for the war, ammunition, their uh, tanks, they were all done in, the, in, in, in that part of Russia. And an, another thing that was very fortunate for us is the the United States gave a lot, you know, gave a lot of food, sent a lot of food. They would, uh, we would get American, we would get flour, we would get sugar. They would send dry eggs, spam. I still love spam till today. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so things were a lot better, a lot better. And in 1944, uh, my, I've, till then, I was an only child, and I was almost 11 and a half years old, which was not planned. My parents said that there was not a time to have a child, but, you know, I'm very happy that it happened, because at least I have one sister, and she was born in 1944 in the Ural Mountains. Uh, in Siberia. In Siberia. Yeah. So from 1941... Till 1946, uh, we were in deep in, in Russia, and then uh, because we were Polish citizens, uh, they were, we were allowed to be repatriated and go back to Poland. Even so, our home was not in Poland anymore; it belonged to Russia then, because it was part of the Ukraine. So we just, we left Russia in 1946, and I think it was probably late in the, uh, maybe in the winter time, because I remember it was winter. And again we traveled by train, again we traveled in, in the cattle cars, well, no except, no, they didn't center. have, no, yeah, well, they did, no, they made, but this time they built, uh, like, platforms, like benches that yeah, you can sit No, on? platforms that you can actually lay down and you can oh. sleep on. And they get each family got a little uh, cubicle. And they had a stove in the middle of the, uh, the, cattle, of the cattle car that you can uh, cook some food. And uh, we were for weeks. We traveled for weeks, so we got into Poland. And we just, uh, we never stayed in Poland. We just kept going. We were in Poland maybe a month or two in Breslau. It was actually belonged to Germany before and illegally um, we uh, crossed the borders into Germany. And uh, that was 1946. That was 1946. And we came to uh, our first stop was Bergen-Belsen. By that time, 
Did you hear all the stories? We knew, yeah, happened? but we did not find out till 1945 what happened in Europe. Wow. Not till the war finished did we find out that we had no place to go back. No home. Nobody, no. Uh, the Russians never let, if, whether they knew or not, they didn't let us know that uh, the whole Jewish population was decimated. They had no idea whatsoever. We knew it was not good because we heard bad things, uh, you know, um, in, the, in 1940 and 41, but we didn't know that they were doing such terrible things. That we didn't find out till we came to, uh, and to you know, when, when we came back. So you, you had no desire to go back and see your home? No, you? we never went back home. Uh, well, my parents were afraid to, you, they, they were afraid that the Russians, if we stop, then we won't be able to get back into Poland. And we didn't, my, my father did not like what was going on in Russia. There was not a place to stay. He said he wanted to get away as far from Europe as he could. <laughs> he did. So and how long was he with you when you were in Siberia? Oh, he was with us all the time. We, not, we were, the, uh, that, that was it. From four, we, from 42 on, we were together with my dad. Well, that was fortunate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very fortunate. So when we came to Germany, we first landed in, in, in the British zone in Bergen-Belsen. By that time, they already, uh, uh, they cleaned it all up. And it was, uh, you know, the barracks that they used for the SS, that's where the Jewish people stayed, but you, it was a terrible feeling because you could see the mass graves, the crema, they had crematoria there, you could see it standing. They had no gas chambers in Bergen-Belsen, but you can see the, the crematoria. Mm -hmm. And then we wanted to get into the American zone because my parents, we had family in, uh, in the United States and they thought, that that would be the best place for us to go. Was your father's My family? father's idea. Yeah, he had some aunts and uncles. Where, where do they live in? Uh, in New, New York. States? New York? Yeah. Okay. They were older people. They are not. Uh, they were already older people when we got here. They came here before the First World War. So then from Bergen-Belsen, a few months later, we went into the American zone, and we wound up in a... DP camp near Frankfurt okay. uh, called Bensheim. And by that time, I was, I was 13 years old when yeah. I came to Germany. And uh, life was still not, I, to tell you the truth, I, it was not, I don't remember a normal life since I was uh, eight years old because we were always uh, going from one, we were displaced persons. Yeah, we had no, there was no home. We didn't belong any place. There was not a place that we belonged. Wow. And uh, when we came to Germany, uh, we were in, in Germany until 1949, and this is how long it, to, it took us to be yeah. able to come to the United That's States. That's how long you were in the DP camp. Yes, from 46, from to, 46 to 49. Wow. But they, but you know, they they had schools and you know conditions were. I mean, was that Frankfurt? Near Frankfurt, near Frankfurt, near Frankfurt on Main, and uh, uh, they send uh, they send uh, from Israel. They send the young people to open schools and to organize the children. And uh, you know, there was a lot of children left uh, that had no parents. They were orphans. So um, it was, you know, they tried to organize, and, you know, we had a lot of help from the American Army men. You know, they gave us things, and the Jewish, uh, uh, the Hayas, you know, the Jewish Federation, uh, they did a lot of work to help the refugees. And uh, uh, the camp, the DP camp we stayed was much better than some of the others because it was in a small town. It was a college town. They had two campuses, and that's where they, you know, they put up uh, the refugees. So we stayed like in the in in the, those uh, classrooms in the dormitories. That's how we made our home for three years. And I remember once walking with my girlfriends. And it was just before we were 
we knew that we were leaving for the United States, and we we were all wondering what it, how it would be to live in a home and have your own bedroom and to live a normal life. That's what you were dreaming of. Oh. So not till I came here in 1949, I came to Detroit, that we finally... We landed in New York? We, we landed in Boston. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, then, you know, we were two, two weeks in Boston, and they put us on a train, and uh, we came to Detroit. We didn't know a soul, nobody. <laughs> and... Uh, Is that where your uh, father's... No, no, Maybe. they were no. We came through the Where's federation the because that's where they had worked for my dad. Oh, yeah, that's good reason. Yeah, so you know, and uh, so my yeah. Detroit was the uh, Detroit area has been my home since 1949, and that's when I went to school and just life became normal. We we became normal human beings. <laughs> You appreciated that. Oh my God! Okay. Do you appreciate that? I till today I appreciate it. You don't realize when you don't have a home what it means to not have a home. You know, I can when I see when they talk about people being homeless, I can understand very well what it means to be homeless. Yeah. It's got to be frightening, it's scary. It's, yeah. You know, I'm always thinking. That in one way, I mean, I was still a child. I was only eight years old when all this started for me. But I had what my mother went through because she always shielded me from all the things. How it must have been for her. You had a good mom. Yeah, yeah. she was a very good mom. And both my parents, you know. So tell me a little bit about... Uh when you settled down in Detroit, what your mother did and what your father did? Well, my dad went to work, and uh, he was, uh, uh, he used to uh, work for builders. He used to do the uh, the kitchens and, you know, libraries. That was his, and he he worked till he was 65 years old. And uh, he always used to tell me those were the best years of my life, he said, because I didn't have to worry anymore that somebody's going to come and chase me out. And, uh, you know, my parents just loved it here. I mean, you know, they, they had, it was me and my sister, and uh, my parents had grandchildren, you know, I had four children, my sister had two children, and uh, their life was, they both lived to be into their 80s, early 80s, and uh, they really appreciated the life here. And uh, I came here, I went to school, um, I adjusted pretty, uh, you know, I did learn when I was in Russia, they did teach us English. Oh. And uh, so I had some, you know, beginnings of it, so when I came here, I came, we came in May, and then uh, I was at that time 16 years old. And I went right into high school. I had no problem adjusting to school. And uh, when I was about 16, I met an, uh, my husband, who was also a survivor. And Where did uh, you meet him? I met him in Detroit uh, at somebody's house. And he was just getting ready to go into the army. They was, was that a blind date. It was no, it was not a blind date. We were, I was invited with my parents to uh, uh, for a lunch, and he, uh, they had a uh, their son was a friend of mine, and he came. He was his friend, and he came with another couple of guys. And uh, I don't know. We just it uh, within a year. Uh, that year, we we kind of you know. Uh, kind of liked each other, I guess. Whatever it is, he was eight years older than me. <laughs> but it didn't matter. It didn't matter because uh, we were from the same background. We had, you know, it was easier for us to adjust. Common. We had a lot of things in common. And he was, uh, he went into the American Army, and uh, after he got out in 51, uh, 
we decided that uh, I was almost through with school and we got married in 1952. I was uh, almost 19 and a year later I had my first child. My husband uh, went to work uh, as a mechanical draftsman for one of the uh, auto companies, but he always dreamed of being his own boss. So he opened up a repair shop in Detroit. In Detroit, and because he could fix anything, and you know, he know, knew mechanical, and he did go to school to learn some mechanics, and uh, that was he started uh, in 1954. He started his business. It's still going. My son is running it now. My youngest son. It's very well known in Michigan. Good. So uh, he had a good life. I had four children. Two son, uh, three sons, one daughter. I had three grandchildren. I unfortunately lost one boy. And uh, I also unfortunately lost my husband way too soon. He died in, 19, in 2004. And, uh, but we had a good 52 years, so. Yeah, good memories. Good memories very good memories we had. Uh, he was a successful man. He was very well known. And uh, uh, I can't complain. My life is, uh, I'm very thankful for every day. That's I get up in the morning and I say, boy, I say, it's good to be alive. Yeah. So your uh, son is doing a good job in continuing the business. My youngest son, yeah, he's doing very well. My oldest son lives in California. Uh, two of my children, my daughter and my one of my sons graduated from the University of Michigan. They, uh, Good school, yeah. My, right? My oldest son graduated from MIT. One of the be best it's schools in the country. It is, yes. yes. He was a very successful man. So my children did very well. So what brought you to, uh, after your uh, husband died, that you uh, wind up? Uh, wound in up 2006, to my, my second son uh, never married. Uh, he's an MBA. Right now he's uh, teaching. Uh, accounting and uh, uh, business statistics as a, at, at the Scottsdale Community College. Uh, he came here, he, he's wanted to come, uh, you know, to a warmer climate for many years. And uh, when things uh, started going pretty bad in Michigan, he, uh, the company that he worked for uh, uh, went bankrupt. Oh. And he lost his job, and uh, he had a very hard time finding anything. It was just, uh, there was no work. So he came, he wanted to move to Phoenix. And he asked me if I would come with him. He said, you know what, it would be a good change for you, you know. You'd probably like it, he said, you know. If you want to come with me, come. And I'm much closer here. My daughter lives in Oregon, and yeah. my oldest son in California. So I just have one son in Michigan. but. I go there as much as I can. He's the one that's taking uh, care of the business. Well, it's yeah. his now. Yeah. 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 He's taken but it your over. Husband my husband started it. He started in 1954. Yes. He started it. And it's still going full blast. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Lots to be thankful for. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's for sure. That is okay. for sure. Okay, I think uh, the story ends on a happy well, that, note. Yeah, you know, all is well when it ends well. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still going on and you keep yourself uh, busy while you're here yes, in Arizona. Yes, yes. And you know, when I did, I joined uh, uh, the Holocaust Survivors Association. For many years I did not consider myself a Holocaust survivor. Because I was, you know, I was not under the Germans. Uh, I was in Russia, and I thought that I didn't qualify. And uh, when I heard what my husband used to tell me, I mean, he survived in, in Poland. 
hiding in the woods. And, uh, you know, I thought that I got away with, with really, as bad as it was, it didn't come close to what the people that lived under the German occupation. Right. But people kept saying, of course you're the survivor. Yes, you are. You were, you know, you were kicked out of your home. You were just a little child. And the Russians weren't the picnic either. <laughs> So, you know, uh, and for years and years you never even talked about it. I didn't even, uh, I remember when my parents would start reminiscing about Russia, I said, why do you do that? Just forget about it. Well, you don't realize how important it is not to forget about it. That's right, to remember. To right? remember, that right. you, we need to remember. And there's so many different ways that people survived the war, and every, every way it happened. It should be told and it should be uh, remembered because uh, it was a, it was such a different time. Yeah, Let's just hope that the times like this are never ha going to happen again. Very important for future, very important. future generations to and you know that. and you know my children they you know my my daughter in law my oldest daughter in law she's very involved in getting all the genealogy of of our families Good. that uh, uh, perished. And she found, she, there's so many things she found out that they, I had no idea because my mother never told me and I really didn't know. But a lot of things are really still there to find out. There's birth certificates, there's death certificates. You, you find out things that, uh, I even have papers that tell me where I was, that I was in Uzbekistan. If I tell people Uzbekistan, they say, where is it? <laughs> well, if yes. you want to know, it's not far from Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. No, you are a survivor and a fortunate one. I'm very fortunate, yes. That's for sure, very fortunate. I mean, there's so many stories. I mean, I could sit here for, you know, that happened during the war, but, you know, I'm just giving you a very... Uh, you, you're you giving me a condensed version. Just a condensed <laughs> version of what really happened. Well, I think that's good, and I do thank you very much for letting me interview you and uh, for you to tell me your story. That's, uh, well, that's it's very good. nice what you're doing. I think that that's a beautiful thing you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I feel good about what I'm doing because my main purpose is to remind future generations that this horrible period happened yes. and that uh, it must be remembered. And that sure has. sure has to be remembered. Because there are so many deniers out there. It's so incredible. Oh. And the deniers are wealthy and they are well educated. That's what uh, certainly surprises well, me. Well, they just don't want to know. They <laughs> They don't want to know. They just want to, it should go all under, swept under, under the, the carpet. Yeah. Terrible. Are we done? I think that we have finished. Good. Thank you so much. Well, okay. thank you. Okay. I don't know. So that.